a good friend. Uh, we, I don't know how we go back. What? 15 years, maybe? Uh, probably longer than that. Back when, uh, what was the band? Uh, Y'all's band was so great. 10 Mile Drive. 10 Mile Drive. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so Shay's a, a band guy. He played in bands. He, he's a writer. He's a producer. Um, and he's developed something that I think is really great. He's kind of developed a team of people that he rotates in and out and he produces music and the music he produces, uh, he's got relationships that he brings uh, the projects to the music to, and you find homes for the music. So um, that's my kind of quick and dirty introduction. AJ might have a little more complete and proper introduction. I should say that you. <laughs> <laughs> no. um, known for his work in TV film as a composer and songwriter, our next trainer has written and produced many popular artists and bands. In addition, he has toured as a solo artist and in various bands himself. Please welcome producer, songwriter, artist, Shay Watson. Hey. hey. All right. <laughs> hey, thanks for joining us. Thank you for having me. Yeah, so today we've been talking about sync supervision and clearance. Mm -hmm. We talked about how we work at the sync center uh, on the supervision side and on the music side. Um, so um, we want to hear from you and kind of how you work. Okay, yeah, and uh, I'll, I'll give you a little bit more uh, background on me and uh, maybe some of this can generate some discussion. Hey, there we go. Now I can kind of see myself on the screen. Yeah, there we go. Um, I've uh, really been hitting the sync world hard for probably about uh, 10 to 12 years now. Uh, one of the main shows that I work on on almost a daily basis is a, a daytime drama on CBS called The Young and the Restless. I do a lot of the background music for that show and also write songs, but um, I uh, have uh, music that's in uh, various uh, movies. Uh, I just did the third installment of uh, the Cats and Dogs music uh, this past year through Universal. A um, few uh, movies on Netflix, uh, Aliens Ate My Homework. And uh, um, let's see, uh, Haters Back Off, I've done music for that show. A lot of the Discovery Channel shows, uh, History Channel, A&E, um, I've done a lot of underscore for those uh, shows as well. But uh, previous to uh, getting full force into uh, doing uh, television and movie sync, I was, as John said, a uh, a band guy. I, I came to uh, Nashville about 23 years ago, and uh, at the time I was uh, focusing on my writing, but uh, soon found myself in a band uh, that toured for a, a few years. We wound up uh, wound up signing a deal with an imprint of Sony Music. And uh, it was sh very short lived and uh, went back on the road as a solo artist and then formed a duo. Now, it was at the point that I formed the duo that I first got my feet into uh, TV and film. We had uh, written a song called Bring It On, which was a big football song. I had it on my radar to... Uh, at that time, I had be began exploring possibilities other than the framework of trying to land the label deal in order for us to uh, make money. And, and in my head, I was thinking, OK, we, we need to start investigating how to go about getting songs in ads, how to get them in football stadiums, in anywhere that music is used. Let's cater a few songs that we think we can take and pitch to these areas. So uh, we wrote a big sports song, Bring It On. It wound up getting licensed by Fox uh, first uh, for their game day programs, uh, Fox Sports, and then it got licensed by uh, ESPN. And at that point, I started seeing how 
fruitful the sink world could be. Two so separate one, uses. Yes, separate uses. Uh, so at that point, it, it was bringing in a little bit of money, but also at the same time, it was free advertisement for the song and for the act and something we could put behind our names to get gigs. Um, so we, we used that and we ran with it. But the, the band ended, I was at a transitional point in my life where I had been on the road for years with different bands. I was ready to stay home a little bit more. So I uh, did what always uh, was my thing, which was concentrating on songwriting and producing. Started working with different uh, bands that I had met on the road. But always in the back of my mind was, hey, you know, you had this these placements, this licensing that did well, let's start exploring um, ways that I can translate this to other acts that I'm working with and we can get residual money coming in for the bands and for myself. We began doing that. We began uh, uh, writing uh, specifically uh, for uh, trying to get songs on ads, uh, television wasn't as fruitful at first, but um, I uh, wound up meeting a song rep uh, in LA that has now worked with me for uh, the past uh, maybe 14 years. And uh, she became a champion of my music and turned it on to a couple of uh, music supervisors. Uh, one of them in particular, Paul Antonelli, was uh, over at uh, Nickelodeon at the time working on a show called Hollywood Heights. And he started using a lot of pop music that I was doing. And um, then found out that I was a multi-instrumentalist, trained in a lot of different areas, producer. So uh, through my rep, he began asking, uh, hey, we, we have need for this type of music uh, that kind of sounds like music they use in Cafe Del Mar, Buddha Bar, it's like a metro type of uh, R&B-ish mix. Uh, do you think Shay could uh, produce some of that? So it began just building a, up a catalog of that music. Well, Paul winds up going over to uh, CBS and working on the show, The Young and the Restless, takes my catalog with it and uh, turns uh, me on to a few of the supervisors over there who started using my music um, almost every other day on the show. It, it was crazy how many placements that I was getting. Um, at that point in time, this was uh, maybe about a year or two after working with my rep, I started making trips to LA. We had built up a level of trust to where uh, she knew that I was not going to usurp and go around her and cut her out of, um, out of any money owed to her for establishing the right relationship. So she began to introduce me directly to music supervisors because it had, uh, my music was being used so much that it was becoming cumbersome for the supervisors to come to her with directions and then her to, to, to translate them to me. So after that level of trust was built, I began to be introduced to a number of music supervisors, uh, not only at CBS, but at Hallmark, at Lifetime, uh, that could come directly to me and uh, for their needs. And Really, that's uh, what began happening. These uh, supervisors uh, would uh, come to me. It was I, I would wake up at the beginning of the day and I would have messages to either call or text or email so and so. Uh, we need this top track or this top song in four to eight hours. And uh, so I would jump on the phone and I would get all of the details and I would start working. And I would usually meet my turnaround time. Um, so, so what was happening was I was getting a, a ton of work. And uh, the reason I was getting a ton of work was because I have my own studio. I'm a multi-instrumentalist, uh, the keyboards, piano is my primary instrument, but I play all instruments, brass, 
strings, guitar, also do a lot, a lot of uh, programming. So I was turning songs very, very quickly, but you can see how that in itself can become quite a challenge. And this is where we get to developing the team. Um, I needed to move faster because I was getting uh, a lot of work from different sources. And uh, so I started finding people that uh, did uh, what, what I did, but, but uh, did it as, as fast as, and for, for instance, I, I'm more of a keyboard player, although I play a guitar and play bass, I'm um, not as proficient as some producers are in that area. So what I began to do was seek out other producers that I knew were very proficient in uh, areas that uh, I wasn't as proficient in, and I would uh, work deals with, with them. And uh, the deals were, were all across the board. At first, I was straight up paying uh, people to, to do work so I could get this music in. But uh, what I was finding that I was having to go back and forth uh, with, oh, well, we need this change. We need this change. We need this uh, change. So um, I didn't want to have to be doing payouts every time I asked for revisions. So uh, I wound up working deals with a number of these musicians slash producers where I would uh, cut them in on a percentage of the publishing or writer's credits uh, for the songs that uh, we were working on. And that worked out well. I developed, I uh, found some guys that were extremely quick, just like me, uh, that were very adaptable, took directions well. And uh, so we began developing, developing a team that way. Um, <clears throat> I would have artists that would see all of this action that was happening and even publishers and uh, labels that would see this action. And uh, that's, when the phone how you do. That, that's when the uh, phone would start ringing uh, for me to, hey, will you work with this artist? Will you, will you work with this songwriter? And you want to say, yeah, because uh, as a writer in Nashville, you're always looking for opportunities. Uh, but, but what I was finding, if they didn't have their own studio and if they didn't have a lot of the capabilities that I was doing, I was just getting so extremely bogged down in uh, work. So in assembling um, a team and finding specific artists that I wanted to uh, work with, what I always looked out for was, okay, uh, do you proficiently operate your studio, whether, do you have a studio and can, can you use a doll and uh, can you do it proficiently and, and quickly, um, especially with vocalists. Uh, I would uh, try to find vocalists that could record themselves, that could edit their own vocals, get them back to me. Um, oftentimes we would not be in the room and trying to uh, make these uh, deadlines that uh, we were making. But uh, that, that's initially how I jumped into was assembling the, the team as uh, far as that goes. Uh, I would uh, also begin to get a request other from, from people other than who my rep was bringing to me. And this was also creating a challenge because while I was trying to be creative over here, um, I was also getting requests over here and having to handle paperwork. So I, I uh, kind of slimlined that and just started sending everyone through my rep. It was uh, worth it to me to have someone else handling the licensing administrative side of things and allowing me to uh, just be creative. Sorry, I'm having a hard time hearing. John, you're muted. We can't hear you. Sorry. Sorry about that. <laughs> All right. Talk, can you talk a little bit about the administration part of it that you wanted to offload? What all, what all, what was the dirty work that was being done? 
Well, um, for for one, uh, there was everything from registering the the songs with the PROs, with performing rights organizations, to making sure that uh, cue sheets that were uh, coming in from the supervisors uh, were were correct um, and, and that they were making them to the PROs for collection because a lot of what I was doing was dealing with back end royalties um, <clears throat> as opposed to upfront royalties. But also speaking of the upfront, you would also have to uh, grant uh, licenses to um, either the producers of the uh, movies or shows that you were working on, and that would be done through the um, music supervisor. And uh, you're you're dealing often at that point they're dealing with two different types of license, which is one which is sync license, just to uh, more so think of it as. Uh, the the publisher and writer granting the rights to use the music in itself but behind the scene and you're also dealing with a master license which is uh granting the license to specifically use this recording that you've seen in as opposed to <clears throat> having someone else re-record the uh song for you so um i was uh you know, I, I I didn't have the the time to, to be creating and dealing with that at the same time. So I I would offload a lot of that to this person who represented me, and uh, took a commission off of um, any work that she was doing for me in that area. And uh, speaking of like it, it was fairly easy with me, uh, because I. Uh, <coughs> I, I've been in publishing deals previously, but at the time that I really jumped into the the sync world, I owned all of my own publishing. And um, I also when I was creating the tracks, I, I owned the masters. I was the producer of the track. So I was kind of a one stop shop. You know, there there wasn't a lot of different people that you had to, to go through, which which brings up a point uh, here. This is something that I I discovered early on. When you're working with different artists, you want to have a contract in place to where they grant you the rights to sign off and to license. You, you go ahead, you get their publishing information. A lot of the artists that I work with are not in publishing deals. Uh, some of them are, but a lot of them are not. So uh, they will, uh, we'll, we'll do a separate contract to where they grant me uh, the rights to negotiate on their behalf. And um, if, if I know that the artist is working or signed with a publisher, I will go ahead and have that artist contact their publisher and have their publisher sign off uh, with me because the last thing is supervisors, music supervisors move so quickly. I, and uh, often, oftentimes with the world that I live in, which 80% uh, of what I do is daytime television, uh, we are moving so fast that literally I will have requests in and I will have to do a turnaround in four or five hours. That's the window that I have from start to finish of the song. That's creating the song, writing the song, uh, recording the song, mixing and mastering the song and getting it out the door. So you don't want to be at the same time trying to deal with calling a publisher and then sometimes those guys not having a full understanding and wanting to negotiate up because you've just lost your opportunity uh, at that point. But, uh, but being a one-stop shop uh, like I am and having those contracts in place with the people that I work with uh, creates a lot of ease as far as that goes. And then of course, there's the contract with me that they have that allows them to, uh, to grant uh, me the rights to sign off and any of my sub agents, uh, which would also be my rep. I have a separate contract with her. She negotiates on my behalf. And uh, 
uh, will will work those deals. So so everything's covered as far as people coming uh, to to get licenses. Yes. Question. Question. Shay, do, are you do you find yourself negotiating on price or are they oftentimes favored, not favored oftentimes. nations? This is the price. It is what it is. Yes, um, it used to. And, and uh, you know, like I said, I really got heavy into this only in the past decade. Uh, once I started making, I, I, I see how drastically, drastically uh, sink prices have changed in the past just 25 years. Uh, after I began making trips out to LA, getting to know uh, supervisors and other guys that have worked in this area much longer than I have for, you know, 35, 40 years, um, I would be told that, um, you know, 25 years ago, negotiation was more common. You can negotiate for uh, some of these spots that I'm just getting back in on. You used to could get 20 grand up front for those because there was a lot more money on the table uh, at the time. It's, it's, it's kind of, if you think how the uh, world has worked once iTunes and Napster hit, all of our money gets chiseled down. There's not as much money on the table. Well, I think a similar thing must have happened in uh, television. You've got a lot of shows, a lot of networks. You're dealing with streaming, so budgets are not there like they used to. So 20 years ago, you you would have maybe let's say gotten offered uh, twenty grand. Well, I had one uh, uh, supervisor that I was talking to that told me, yeah, the, you know, we were making bank back in the day. But then you saw about fifteen years ago, it started decreasing. And then it went from twenty grand to fifteen grand up front. Then a little shortly after it was 10 grand up front, then seven grand up front, then it dropped up about five grand. And then slowly it got down to where, you know, people, newcomers coming, were, were happy with getting 2,500 bucks up front plus your back end. Well, now we've entered into an area to where a lot of times you just sign on to gratis queues which uh, means that uh, you, you're not going to demand a bunch of upfront money. You're going to make a living off of the back end uh, that, that you get off this. Now, let me tell you, that's, that's not the case in every situation. Um, that, that's a lot of network stuff that I do. Some network stuff I've gotten up front for, but most of the major network stuff, they know that you're going to make more money uh, because it's going to be played over and over syndicated. So you're not getting up front. A lot of uh, the networks um, that work with like A&E, uh, uh, certain shows, uh, Lifetime, Hallmark, they, they'll give me upfront money. They'll, they'll offer upfront money, but it's, it's not huge. It's, it's, it's not like it, uh, it's not like it used to be. Um, and usually John's question was, do you negotiate? Um, often not. Yes, you can, you can ask for more, uh, but they typically head it off at the start and say, here's what's in the budget. Here's what we have all in. Are you there? And uh, then you either take it or leave it. I'd rather take something than nothing. Uh, but but honestly, um, back end money has has sustained me, and it's been really good, and it's residual. So I've I've been fairly happy with it. Would I love to be, see a resurgence of a lot of front end money? Yep, absolutely. But uh, in today's day and time, uh, how things are set up, it's it's not likely at the moment. John, you may have seen the big debate um, back in uh, 2019 when Discovery uh, was uh, wanting to uh, forego the front end to their company. Yeah, uh, and, and that, that, that threw us in a big conundrum uh, there because uh, there we were getting so little and they were wanting you to sign away uh, a lot of the, sign away um, a lot of your back end. Yeah, uh, on that I should say. And something, Shay, that we talked about this morning. Let me just pull up one bit because I think this is this is vital to, to understanding the different 
kind of content we're talking about, all all music is not equal, right? There's different the different value. Let me find this bit here. Where is that? I'll put my hands on it here and find it in a little bit. But I mean, yeah. you're you're moving fast, yeah, and and you're you need it done by Thursday or today even. But there's a lot of projects that are we're working on for six months, and that's kind of what we see here. Is like we don't move as fast as Shay does. We've got, you know, we're going after. You know, we're using Garth Brooks, and that's a different. The, the music music is happening at a different level, and there yeah, it is it is negotiated. So I just I want to kind of. Um, you know, yeah, the, and, and you know, I've I've had a few of those. Uh, uh, mainly, I would say that uh, those have come from um, Netflix and ads. Yep. And uh, you will uh, get yeah, here's, here's oh, this. Here's this, and this may I mean may be worth looking at. Like, there's known music up top, and there's unknown music at the bottom. And the bottom bottom music doesn't have a lot of leverage. Can you guys yeah. see that? And up up top, there's a lot of leverage. So one size doesn't fit all. What what we work on is different from what Shay's working on. We work slower. Shay works faster. We work with maybe known songs and some middle tier songs. You know, maybe a cue for uh, Discovery Channel. Nobody knows what who did that song yeah it's kind of it's kind of it's just lesser known lesser leverage song so you kind of have to go if you know if they're doing five thousand a song you're like yes done no no negotiation so this is something that i think is important because everybody there's different there's up market there's mid market and there's down market yeah. different yeah. different head spaces all together so just wanted to yeah uh, uh like a uh you know, trying to think of some examples, like you said, mostly I deal in bulk and I deal extremely fast. Um, but like, for instance, the uh, two movies that I did, uh, I, I had about um, over a month's worth of time to work on those. And it was a thing to where we had a relationship because of the previous project uh, that I had done. And uh, the way that I was approached was, uh, hey, we need songs specifically to be featured in these scenes right here. Um, tell me some of the artists that you're working with that may vibe with this. And if so, can you create this? Now, at that point, there was a negotiation and the negotiations were, uh, you know, pretty substantial between my rep um, Sure. With with those that were working on it, and then um, <clears throat> like the cats and dogs uh, movie uh, that I did, um, I we had a song in that, and uh, we had to renegotiate everything because we were planning a uh, limited theater run release worldwide, and then the pandemic hit, so uh, we had to. Uh, uh, th they found outlets for that, um, but uh, we also wound up doing a direct to Blu-ray and DVD. Well, before when we thought this whole theater thing was uh, in the mix, we had negotiated in a separate uh, mindset. So we came back and uh, revisited that. Um, but yeah, exactly what you said. It's, uh, there's, there's different levels of priority. And most of mine is uh, mid level to just really quick, low leverage bulk. Yep. And I would say too, there's even a tier under that, which we talked about earlier called micro sinks, which are just like, <laughs> super small we don't play in that yeah, yeah market at all but if you're a wedding photographer or if you're a youtuber and you just need music under your wedding videos you know you can get library music that's micro sync stuff that's just you pay 20 bucks a month and you get all you can use 
Yeah. Yeah, I haven't really ever dealt much in in that area. Uh, at in the beginning, when I when I uh, first uh, was trying to get into to the sync world, I did try out a few libraries, but libraries have never really worked uh, well for me. Um, I, mine has always been a uh, less meet people and less develop a relationship, and uh, you know some some of the soup supervisors are even people that if I weren't doing music with them, I'd hang out. Right. You know, we, we have that rapport together and it's, yeah. it's just worked better for me than trying to get in libraries yep. and such as that. But I could see how, you know, if you, if you had enough uh, music and uh, putting it in a library, how, how it may possibly become fruitful for you, mm -hmm. but just an area I haven't really ever explored that much. Yeah, yeah, yeah. totally get it. So, um, Shay, talk, can you talk about the relationship? Because one of the things we talked about earlier is like people are everything, mm -hmm. especially in sync. People are everything. Relationships, high integrity, low bullshit. Oh, gosh, yes. No secrets, no surprises. Uh, Absolutely. And, and shine a light on why that's, important I'm, I'm going to shine a light on a few things and try not to get myself in trouble yeah, because right. there there are a, a few situations that I haven't really had to deal with as much as up until the pandemic hit and everybody got desperate and weird uh, <laughs> for lack of a better term in the past like you, 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 look, back back to the conversation uh, that we had earlier making it's your contracts are in place. Um, I, I've, I've always been a, a guy who uh, honored relationships with, with between my rep when she began introducing me directly to music supervisors. She knew that I was not going to be going behind her back, working back end deals with these supervisors and cut her out. It's, that's just not built into me to small to, world to, to be like that. Yeah, because people talk. I, uh, I'm going to give you some examples. Uh, a few years ago, I uh, was working with um, this has happened with a couple of artists. Uh, that were also producers that I brought in. <clears throat> I was working with a couple of them <clears throat> and um, getting their music on uh, television shows and when they start seeing their royalty statements and how well that was, uh, their uh, true colors started shining and I will not mention any names. But uh, I uh, remember the first time I got a call from a, a, a rep and a music supervisor who said, uh, Shay, um, I don't know how so-and-so got our information, but um, I just got a call today with them trying to pitch me music that your name was not on. Mm. And that doesn't sit well with me. Did you know about this? I had no clue. What um, talk about that? What the, what does that mean? Music that your name is not on. What is that? Well, my, when, when I brought them uh, in into the relationship, um, we were creating music. They knew that I was the one with the relationship with the rep and with these supervisors. And supervisors are very protective. Uh, of them themselves it's it's not that easy to get to know them on the level that I've gotten to know a few of them and uh, so this uh, artist wanted to go around me and the rep directly to the supervisor and pitch their back catalog which none of us had anything to do with mm. and that just wasn't was wasn't a cool thing to do I mean, it, it would have been cooler if uh, the artist would have come to me and said, hey, you know, I've, uh, I know we've been doing these songs. I've got some that kind of sound like this in my back catalog. Is there a way that you can uh, maybe see if 
ex supervisor would would listen to to this stuff for me. Um, even if I would have been approached like that with me not having an ownership um, in, in the song, no writer's credits, no producer's credits, I may have been more out to uh, let that relationship happen. But instead, it was a go around your back type thing. And uh, really, I think it bothered the supervisor and the rep more than it bothered me. I mean, it, it bothered me. I was like, ah, yeah, uh, people do that. That's that's just the nature of people. But uh, they, uh, you know, it, it, it created attention. And uh, after I thought about it uh, for a while, I, uh, I no longer work with that artist. And uh, what I found out was that was not the first time that had happened with that artist and uh, with people in my position. So uh, they really kind of shot themselves in the, the foot there. So that, that's one of those just honor type things. Yeah. Think about the way, the way you go about things matter. Just be upfront uh, with, with everything you're doing. The, the thing that I started dealing with in the pandemic was this. Um, we had uh, worked a lot of these uh, deals to where, uh, like I said, I could sign off on granting rights, uh, also with my rep. So when, when I do music for, uh, one, for The Young and the Restless, one R, um, I do a ton of songs for that show. A lot of them that wind up being featured songs um, on the show and they pay well. Well, in order, and you also find, let me back up, these are not one-time usages of these songs. Oftentimes, if a supervisor finds a song that they would like, specifically, uh, I'm going to give you an example from that show. There was one song that I'd written called Hanging On that at, at one point, it was just used like 10 times a week and over a huge, long, extended period. And that adds up. But in order for the supervisors to pull that, that goes directly into their system that they use at, uh, uh, for those specific supervisors that work through the parent company, Sony Music, uh, TV and Film. Well, what I had found, uh, what, what I've recently had happen was, and this has been four, four different artists that have come to me, uh, one that got a record deal uh, based off some music that we had written where the, uh, they included their, uh, the songs that we had written for YNR on their Schedule A for uh. the publishing company and uh, the label. And uh, I wound up getting a request to pull everything out of the catalog that Sony Music TV was using. Uh -huh. in, in their system well of course that didn't sit well with me because hey yeah you've gotten a, a deal over here but you're basically asking me to go to the supervisor and ask him to remove 20 plus songs that we've done together that has made me a substantial amount of money and that has also made my rep a portion uh commission off of that over the past year and uh, what I wound up doing in that situation was explaining to this uh, particular artist, hey, that, that's not kosher. Let, let me just talk to your people that you're working with, explain the situation. Let's see if there's a way we can get some of those taken off the schedule a, or have the rights. Right that situation worked out well. We wound up being able to leave the songs in the catalog. Another artist uh, came to me that had gotten signed to a uh, boutique publishing deal, mm -hmm. which was a smaller publishing company. Uh, they had dealt with, uh, you know, old school publishing for a while, which was getting, you know, songs on, on albums with artists and platforms, but they had just started getting into the uh, sync world and didn't quite understand fully how it worked. Uh, they uh, came to the artist and requested, uh, uh, again, this, this uh, artist slash songwriter, singer songwriter had put the songs we had done for the show, specifically that I'd been requested to do for the show 
on her schedule A and turned it in. And uh, I was asked to remove those uh, songs from the uh, from 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 the cat from the catalog. And uh, it was that whole thing again, going back to the supervisor and hey, this is happening. But before I went to the supervisor that time, I said, put put the publishing company in contact with me. Um, they contacted me. They didn't want to negotiate. Her attorneys and the publishing company said, no, if we own the publishing on these and we're representing the songs, we want to, we, we want them to remove from any other catalogs. Uh, so now we're actually still dealing with that situation right now because when the tracks were created, this particular artist, um, I had neglected to get my producer <laughs> from granting me the rights to the master sign. Now she had signed other rights over, but uh, to the masters, and that's what we're dealing with right now. Is I'm trying to keep these masters in the catalog, and and she's trying to claim so, ownership of of that and remove it from the catalog, which has created a lot of tension. Question, Shay. But is, but I will say this, and now lesson learned from this: the uh, supervisor uh, knew this artist, and the rep had known this artist, and uh, both of them said we will um, never use another song from this artist other than the ones that are in the catalog if they stay there. Yeah, it's a small world. Word gets yeah. right. That's a great story. Can I ask a clarifying question? <laughs> So Shay, is that a that's really a question of admin rights? Yes. Right? I mean, like you've got uh, admin yeah. relationships with your soups, and then second publisher fairly kind of says, okay, well, now for this writer, your co-writer, we control admin rights for her. Yeah, they're saying we control 50% of the master um, uh, license on this and we're not going to grant you that's strange our portion I mean, that that's kind of a short-sighted very short-sighted if, short if a song's okay. getting traction and getting worked and getting plugged yeah and the thing is we, we know this particular artist that every uh, christmas for the past three years uh we we make bank off of christmas because i've done a number of pop christmas songs with her and uh, so uh, it, it didn't make sense to, to me. Uh, what I proposed was if you're concerned about the publishing because they're a uh, publishing slash boutique record label, call themselves a record label, that's dealing with this, why don't we just ha have an assignability clause uh, to where with the PRO we go in and she assigns her publishing portion um, to them. To the publisher for, for what for whatever reason uh they don't want to do that and, and i think i kind of know the reason um people who are coming to the game uh they they have a uh, a lot of them discount the back end residual and and i think that they discount it because uh when when you're dealing with residuals half of it goes to the publisher and half, and half of it goes to the writer. The writer's always going to keep their back end share of the residual mm -hmm. um, money that, come, that comes in quarterly. That, that's the part that the publisher doesn't touch down here. The only sense that I can make of it is because it's split, the publisher sees this as not as much money and they want to go after the bigger fish, yeah, you know, it's up going front. To big yeah. upfront fees, but it's, it's just a harder thing to uh, go after with pre-existing songs. I've found all of my upfront uh, money that I have made has not been me taking songs in my previous catalog and pitching them to movies. It's been a supervisor coming to me saying specifically, this is what I need. <laughs> and uh, so taking pre-existing songs and going for big upfront money, it's, it's just going to be harder. Um, so that, but that's the only sense I could make out of their, their stance on that. 
Right, right. But that's that th this scenario that I'm describing has happened about four times to me since the beginning of the pandemic. And uh, why I think that's happening is people are trying to find money and opportunity. They've been sitting around in their homes, not on tour. So they're signing these deals and dealing with people that, that don't know the world of, of sync and TV uh, properly. And it's just creating a lot of friction. It's put me in a very weird, weird head space, but to where, uh, you know, a lot of artists, I'm, I'm just like, ah, I don't want to take on a new artist. Ah, I don't want to take on this person. I'm just going to concentrate with these people I know are trustworthy right. here that I've already got. Yep. Totally get that. That's great, Shay. Any questions, guys? I mean, we've, I know Shay's got a full day after uh, 1230 here. Do we have um, any questions for Shay while we have him on? I just had one uh, one question. Do you prefer Shay um, working in a fast paced turnaround or do you prefer some people thrive on that? Like I, I like quick deadlines and so I, I, I do. I, I think better fast paced. I, I've, I've joked in my friends joke that I'm, I'm kind of like McDonald's <laughs> of music. I mean, I turn out so much volume um, uh, quickly, but, but I found that I, if I have more time to, to think, um, uh, I, I found that, you know, my snap decisions on music that I make, uh, often those, beginning decisions after I either have read the description or watched the scene that has been sent to me, I'm often correct on how I'm feeling the scene in, in the beginning. And, and I would just jump into it and immerse myself in it and make it happen very quickly. Now, if, uh, but, but here's something that I, that I also do, um, if, if I do have a little bit more time where it's like, you've got a day, day and a half to do this, I'll do multiple options for the scene to send. Um, but, uh, I've, uh, I've, I've almost got it down to, to a science and I, I found that my snap decisions and my quick movement is uh is it works out for me i make better decisions having to think fast mm -hmm. actually you also work with some well-known bands yes uh what was what was their name um blessed union of souls yeah uh, was is one of the ones that i'm working with uh Right now, matter of fact, we got a video that's coming uh, out um, here in about another uh, week or two uh, called Smile. Uh, we've been running some promos on that, and and this this brings up a good topic. When when I do have um, well known bands that I've worked with, it does pique uh, interest in in the rips. Because some of them will remember a lot of the uh, not reps, the supervisors, because a number of the supervisors are, uh, you know, my age range, which I'm 47 and, and above uh, a lot of them that I'm working with. And so we were often, you know, in yeah. high school and college at the same time. So like Blessed Union Souls, they were uh, ironically one of, one of my favorite bands. Uh, when I was coming up because they were a piano-based rock band and I used to play a lot of their music. So when they first uh, came to me, uh, wanted me to, to produce uh, songs for them, I knew that uh, I wanted to also gear it toward uh, sync. And, and to give you a little background, Blessed Union Souls, their, their number one big hit was a song called I Believe, uh, which hit in uh, 1995. And they've had eight top 10 uh, singles since then. Uh, their, most of their success was in the late 90s, uh, early 2000s. Uh, yeah. Hey, Leonardo, She Likes Me For Me, I Want To Be The One. Songs you'd recognize, but you don't know the band name now. <laughs> uh, but uh, we, uh, I've, I've been able to get the band a lot of uh, placements. And that's been very good for uh, residual money. And, and a lot of that's come just because um, the, the supervisors remembered 
the band from back in the day. And it was cool having that uh, relationship. And another uh, thing that uh, has been interesting to me is I've, I've worked with a lot of kids of very famous musicians. Mm. And, uh, you know, and that's, that's kind of a touchy uh, thing to deal with there because a lot of times they want to stand on their own and be known on their own without, you know, knowing mommy and daddy's work. But obviously if you have a, uh, a name like, like for instance, and she wouldn't mind me saying this, but Lily Winwood, um, Steve Winwood's daughter. Uh, I've done a lot of work with her. Um, I've, I've met Steve. I would hung out at his, I actually, I hung out at his uh, 69th birthday party the night before nice. we did our uh, last sync thing that I was speaking on. Nice, uh, nice. For, for you. But um, good. I've, we'd never use, Steve to open those doors, but the supervisors, I, I would notice when I was first sending in um, the her songs to them, they had like it. And then um, uh, fortunately, I get a couple of placements up front and then I'd later get asked the question, hey, I've noticed she's kind of got a little English accent in the last name Winwood. Is there a is there a relationship there? Uh, <laughs> the daughter. And then I'd find that, oh, all of a sudden, we're in a lot of placements, but, uh, <laughs> but, uh, that's happened with a few, uh, uh, famous, you know, a few Love kids it. of famous people that I've, I've worked Chris? with. Yeah. yeah. Question, Chris. So what is, what is your general process, uh, in film and TV? Do they give you some kind of like a quick time movie or is it go all over the board? Sometimes you, Oh gosh, it, it it is all over the board. Um, I, I'll I'll explain a, a few of these to you. Um, used to in the early days, I'd wake up at nine o'clock in the morning. And like I said, I would uh, have messages from the night before. Hey, I need you to give me a call. And uh, on some of those, they wouldn't even take time to send a clip uh, to me. It would be like, here's the scene. And I would even get uh, a portion of the dialogue. I would get uh, references. We want it to sound like this. Here's the, the time. Here's where this is going to happen. Give me a call. And I would call the rep and they would talk me through the scene and, and I would jump on it. Other times I will get sent the clip. They would do that. I would make the telephone call and then they would say, I'm sending the clip over. I want you to watch it. And uh, I would just import the clip into uh, Pro Tools and I would write to that. But these shows, again, if, if I were doing underscore, I would I would send fit to the clip. But a lot of these uh, would be um, featured song. So you want to that it makes it a little difficult because they want you to write a full song uh for that because um oftentimes the the shows have rabid fan bases who want to buy the songs which is a crazy notion uh to me oh, well not a crazy notion uh. but you think of like daytime tv um you know, I, I, I would not think of The Young and the Restless as being something where somebody hears a song and then wants to, to buy it. But um, but they do. These shows have these rabid fan bases where people discuss everything from the dialogue to the songs on the show. So you, I would get sent a scene. Here's the scene. I'd look at it. I would watch it. But we want you to write a full song for this but one that we can scale down and fit to the scene mm -hmm. or one that you can potentially like the last one that I did, I wrote the full song. I had the scene and then I went in and scaled it down and sent it back to them. And uh, they came back and, Hey, well, we, uh, you know, uh, we, we liked this part, but can you get the drum intro that happens right here during the silence that kind of, fades in on this and, and then I would go back and do some uh, re uh, re edits on that. Now, a side note, a song that uh, I did Are you a couple in of surround sound. Also, are you working in surround sound or no? I'm not just two. Okay. Yep. I'm yeah. Yeah. Um, now, uh, 
And when, when I get it to a level, I send it to the supervisor. The supervisor, uh, one of them's also lead composer on the show, and he also does mixing and mastering. So he'll ask for the track itself. And then he will also ask for stems. So if he needs to make any adjustment for surround sound, they're the ones that 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 do that. Um, but um, I, I will give you an example. Um, this was probably about five or uh, actually six years ago. I'd written a song called uh, Something Beautiful. And um, one thing you may not know, John didn't uh, uh, mention uh, after I'd had initial success in the uh, TV and uh, film industry, I was making making pretty good money. I, I decided to invest back in my education. I've, I've been through law school and I'm also a, a lawyer now. But um, right. I remember my first year of law school, six uh, years ago, I was walking into my first uh, exam um, and uh, I get a a call from my rep, Shay. Um, and I looked on my phone. She had left a message. Call me, call me, call me. Um, and I'm like, okay, what's up? Probably need something for a deadline. And uh, but I've got to concentrate on this test. So I went in, took the test, came out and called her and she said, You've been nominated for an Emmy for a, a daytime Emmy for a song that 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 you did, which which was kind of cool. Um for me but that particular song uh something beautiful it was in such a featured scene there was no dialogue and they played the song that um this people off the fan base started buying that song and uh i started uh getting uh emails of uh and i would get sent wedding um what do you call them, wedding brochures to where people had taken that song and used it in their wedding. You know, and I thought, how cool is that? You know, you've heard it on a daytime TV show and, and you like the song enough to purchase it and then use it for this special moment in your own life. And I, you know, just things like that are, yeah. you know, yeah, pretty cool. Bad. And that goes beyond the money making to like the real, you had an impact on somebody point. Jay, I mean, what you just described was something we're going to talk about next week, which is welcome to the experience economy. It's yeah. not really about silver discs anymore. It's about all the different ways people experience music. Yeah. And whether it's downloads or Young and the Restless or a T-shirt or a live stream or a VIP press the flesh thing. That's how people experience music, you know, and it's yeah. there's 30 different ways, you know, so. Well, you know, it, it, what, what's funny to me is like uh, these uh, sometimes uh, different shows like like the Lifetime and Hallmark stuff, they they uh, they may not see your name in the credits, but they'll go to the website uh, Tune Find or, or one of those where it's basically a listing of the show. And then it lists all the songs that are used in that series. And they'll find the information, then they'll actually go to your website or your social media right. and contact you. Right. You know, uh, because of this report uh, that you, you know, that they developed with your song, this right. song that they've wanted. Love it. Very interesting thing. Yeah. And yeah, they'll download it and pay you, but uh, you're you're uh, making some money. But uh, man, I will tell you, we got to figure out a way to get more money off of the whole uh streaming thing from uh spotify and pandora and and purchases because that's you know that's really hurting hurting us on that end but uh, fortunately we still have sync to make us <laughs> income to keep us yeah. afloat over here yep i love it all right shay hey anything else you want to share to our guests here i know you've got a few minutes left you've got a busy day but um anything else no. you want to kind of build in and share with people that you maybe wouldn't share mm. in other places because uh, the, the mission well, here is to build the next generation of great artists. So, you know, it's like, let's let, let me just offer a couple of nuggets that I've, I've had to get my head wrapped around one size does not fit all. Uh, don't try, don't listen to 
this one way of doing uh, things and think that, that you've got to work your self into that find what works best for you i mean um i uh, could be envious of those guys that uh well i i could be envious of the scenario that you have john where you've got this time to work on these full feature yeah. links and do this um but but i but i'm not because i found that the whole speed thing and the whole bulk yeah. thing works for me, that that's in my nature. Right. I, I don't need to try to fit myself over here. I, I work well over here. Uh, find find what works for you, and uh, start small. I mean, just look for opportunities. Uh, one thing that I did early on, and and this is. Fortunately, I didn't have to spend a whole lot of time on the extreme lower level stuff, but I made a list everywhere that music is used. When, when I'm out in public, where am I hearing music? I'm hearing it on overhead radio. I'm hearing it in elevators. When I take a flight, I'm hearing it um, on, on an airplane. I'm hearing it in, in, in malls. I'm hearing it where all is music being used. And then, uh, just approach people. There's no specific way to go about to do it. Well, I will say the specific way is don't be pushy and, and be cool, you know, um, but politely investigate and meet people. And, and I know that's very difficult in this day and age, but um, with, with the whole coronavirus thing uh it's harder for face-to-face meetings i've always done better in face-to-face meetings than cold calls and emails um yeah. you know um but uh just explore and 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 see where it goes it's going to go somewhere you know um you, you don't know exactly where but but uh yeah don't don't put that pressure on you of having to fit in a box and do this and this this way because what works for me may not work for you yeah and uh, have integrity with what you do you know if you're asking yourself whether you should do this or not uh whether you should cut this person out go around and talk to this person over here don't do it you're you're asking yourself that because there is a little bit of a moral dilemma uh, there uh, and the the world of supervisors is is small. People talk, and you don't want a reputation. You want to think long term, right? Really long term. Also, I will say this: don't don't get discouraged in the beginning, because um, you know, uh, like I said, it's what maybe around year twelve of me being heavy in sync. My first uh, two years. I was doing a lot of writing and there there's a uh, John, you know, uh, especially when you deal with back in royalties, there's a lag for one of your creating and you're trying to get your music placed. So you start getting a few things placed, but you don't see money immediately because there's like a two, two quarter lag sometimes, depending on when you get the placement to when your PRO, your performing rights organization pays. So I was sitting there getting discouraged thinking, man, not all this work, where's this money I'm supposed to be getting. But then uh, you see it two quarters later. And at, at, at that point in time, I only had, you know, like a page in my, you know, royalty statements of, um, what I was getting paid for, but now fast forward uh, 10 more years and I open up my royalty statements and sometimes I have 25 pages of show after show, episode after episode of residual income that's built up over the years, because not only am I getting it from immediate placements, but I'm seeing, oh, syndicated over here to Portugal, to Spain, to the UK, to, to this, and then you filled up to where uh, literally when the pandemic uh, hit me, um, yeah, it, it hit because the shows um, halted production. And uh, at, at first we were not able, but, but I sustained 
because I've had years now of residual royalties mm -hmm. that have been built up to where I have that money coming in at every yeah. quarter. But, but my point is it took me over a decade to get there. Yeah. You know? um, five years in, I was making a good income one to where I could support my family. But, you know, now 10 years later, I'm making a substantially good income uh, off of that. So don't get discouraged in the beginning. Just don't get discouraged. Right. Think Love long term. You. Long term. Shay, thanks yeah, so we'll much. Open, and last thing, this will open up doors for you. If you're successful in this area, you'll start getting phone calls from publishers and record labels wanting you to work with their artists. And then at that point, you have to decide whether you want to devote uh, time to work on uh, album songs, even though nobody creates albums anymore. But, but it'll open up those doors for income in that area too. Just yeah. kind of compounds. So be encouraged. Awesome. Shay, thank, thank you so much for thanks, joining us. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks, Shay. Thanks, Shay. Lovely meeting you. Thank Great. you for your time. Nice meeting you too. Oh, and feel free to follow me on social media. Shay. We'll share the links. Something. <laughs> You'll find <laughs> We'll share. We'll share the link. Awesome. awesome, guys. Well, that completes Hacking Music this week. This is day five, sync supervision and clearance. We'll be back next Monday at 10 o'clock central time where we're going to be talking about what, AJ? The experience economy. Experience, experience economy. economy. Yeah. Chris us as one of our guest trainers. Yep. Glenn Peoples from Billboard Magazine. Uh, we're going to be talking about e-commerce, creating remarkable experiences and touching your fans in ways that serves them and monetizes what you're doing. So uh, we'll see you back here Monday at 10. Thanks, John. Right, thank you so guys, much. Have a great weekend. Thanks a lot, guys. Weekend. Have a great weekend. Oh, Enjoy. Thank you, Shay. This is yeah. awesome.